Uh, oh, in fact, that's, uh, well, I, I've got that right here. The example I'll give is, and I think Barry Panner just alluded to this, in British Columbia, uh, we had an electricity policy uh, prior to 2001, which said that 10% of new investment in electricity generation by BC Hydro or contracting with IPPs uh, had to be green, zero, and zero emission was, was a part of that. And under that, um, in the dying days of the NDP government, they uh, launched a major initiative to build a natural gas pipeline to Vancouver Island, and it would have involved building a series of natural gas burning, greenhouse gas emitting plants to generate electricity in British Columbia. Now, I'm among the people who worked very hard to try to do the analysis to show what that meant uh, for greenhouse gas emissions and, and, and what uh, alternatives there were. Now, uh, what's happened is that the, the, the government since then, uh, eight or nine years ago, changed it to like a 50-50 uh, zero emission versus not kind of requirement. And then a couple of years ago, in January, said, we're going to 90%. And I can tell you that at that time, uh, that was uh, pretty well the only jurisdiction in the world that was pushing that far. And it's not pure emissions pricing, but what happens is you basically say to BC Hydro, when you're acquiring power, whether it's yourself building the Site C dam or something else, or you're going to independent power producers for smaller projects, you've got to go with the zero emission projects. Those projects will be more expensive than us building a bunch of natural gas pi uh, pipelines and, and generating plants, we think. It's not, not guaranteed, but we think they will. That higher price is going to be reflected in the rate increases that BC Hydro applies for and ultimately gets from the BC Utilities Commission. So we all end up paying more, a higher price, to reflect this greenhouse gas constraint that we've applied as a regulation in our electricity generating system. So it's an indirect and impure uh, and not precise form of emission pricing, but it is also a policy that has that, that compulsory side to it, which is what you have to have. You have to have the true cost of the environmental impact internalized into the prices that we see, and both of those policies do that. Now, we have lots of evidence, and that's sort of why I'm on these international panels. I work with a lot of experts who analyze the policies that governments have had for uh, the last few decades in trying to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and you're all aware that these policies have abysmally failed. And uh, the policies were not of emissions pricing, and they were not of a regulatory nature. Very, very little of that. It was. Uh, it was uh, information programs like let's inform you of this money you can make by being energy efficient or some subsidies to try to keep that moving along. And I've got a graph here that shows the policy slates and the targets that governments set uh, all along the way. I, I didn't touch it. It was just... Sapporo, your conference is getting sabotaged in various ways. But I'm out of here soon, so I won't, I won't be here. Um, <laughs> so, th some of you have seen this probably, this is a figure that I've got in the book, Hot Air, and um, what you see underneath the, uh, the graph are the targets that governments set as early as 1988. What you see are the policies that they implemented, and we've got blue ones from conservative governments and red ones from liberal governments in the middle, and you see that they seem to, that in each time the government implemented those policies, they said these will get us to the target that we promised. So it wasn't just like, we hope these will do something. They said they'll get us to that target. And of course they didn't, so emissions uh, just kept climbing. And, um, and that's why somebody was just talking to me before my talk and said that, you know, um, we don't like the conservatives right now because their target isn't ambitious enough. And I berated her and I said, never pay attention to targets. You know, pay attention to the policies, to the legislation, to the greenhouse gas emission price or regulation. That's the walk, that's not the talk. And as long as you pay attention to targets, then you've encouraged the politicians to, uh, to, to play that game. And, and it is gonna be very difficult to do good greenhouse gas, to do effective climate policy. Because, well just think about it, if you're a politician, uh, the, the, you know, the best of all worlds is to tell people that you are really concerned about the climate, so those segment of the population who are really concerned will vote for you, and at the same time, and so you have an aggressive target, but at the same time not really to implement policies that price emissions or regulate so that at least the business leaders or Alberta or wherever is also not upset with you. So it's funny, I once gave a talk in which I said, here's evidence 
that our policies have been a failure. This was at the University of Toronto, and a political scientist came down and said, you're completely wrong. This is evidence that the policies were a complete success. Politicians kept getting re-elected, and they were able to get one group to think that they, you know, they were doing something, and they weren't actually doing something. That's political success. So, I mean, that's a nasty thing to say with a politician here in the room, but I, I am going to say that um, British Columbia's climate policies, uh, I have to say it, have completely blown this away. They've, uh, they're the opposite. They are emission pricing, as I already gave you one example, even their regulatory on the electricity side. Um, and, I'm, yeah. and I was even going to show you that while there's the liberal and conservative governments up here, uh, all governments have been prone to this. And so even if we look in our own province, if I, I have the report with me. In 1995, the NDP said our policies will get the emissions down by the year 2000 to their 1990 levels. And so you see that dot there, and there's what emissions happened, for example, in the six years. Now, they were doing nothing different than other parties around, uh, uh, across the country, and maybe if they get in power tomorrow, they'll be different. I'm not trying to say this is what the NDP will do, but I'm just saying nobody's immune from this. Uh, we did this here in British Columbia as well. Now, a few more comments here. Um, so with these strong pricing policies, what will happen? One is that we're going to get a rapid increase in renewables, solar, wind, biomass, hydropower. I mean, otherwise, the outcome is pretty catastrophic, uh, as we've been talking about. But that's only going to happen if there are supporting policies and a mature understanding by interest groups of the difficult trade-offs involved. Remember, impacts versus impacts and risks versus risks, the kind of stuff that Zipporah was talking about. The second is that we will get a dramatic increase in energy conservation and efficiency, but actually, the, and the pricing will help with that, but it also needs support from compulsory regulations and efforts at growing public awareness. And again, uh, here in British Columbia, especially with BC Hydro playing the lead there, we're doing fairly well uh, if you compare elsewhere. I think we can do so much more and need to, but again, the work I do internationally, we're among the world's leaders. Finally, um, we're going to see, we should see, a rapid shift towards electricity use for things like transportation, whether it's plug-in hybrid uh, cars, battery electric cars, for heating buildings and heating water, heat pumps mostly, and for specific thermal applications in industry. Sit down and think about, oh yeah, how do emissions go down? What I do is I build energy economy environment models and, and run them for governments, interest groups, and it's, I'll, I'll go on and people, I'll go on a media show and people will say, well, you know, but we'll still drive cars with gasoline. And I'll say, well, no, the numbers don't add up. Or I'll get in an argument with Terrace and Gas who will say, we'll still use natural gas in our homes. And I'll say, no, the numbers don't add up. You got to get the, the new homes can't be hooked up to natural gas. So, uh, because we don't capture the carbon from the natural gas uh, in those homes. So those are the kind of things that, uh, that tell us that the fuel switching effect is going to be very important switching away, as Zipporah said, from burning fossil fuels. Uh, and that's going to be more important even, or it's, it's going to swamp the efficiency effect, even if we become very efficient. And what that means is that our emissions uh, will go up. And I'm going to skip 